Hello again and welcome back to Pathology, this time for chapter 15. We are going to be discussing mental disorders and disorders of sleep, anxiety, mood, eating, and substance use. Some of these have a stronger implication for the massage therapy profession than others. Certainly things like eating uh, disorders won't necessarily affect what's going on in the office per se. Um, but you can definitely alter your massage to particular issues that their bodies may be having due to this eating disorder. Mood disorders can definitely uh, create havoc within the massage therapy session itself, as well as anxiety. Sleep disorders tend to affect the massage therapy session a little bit less unless the client is absolutely exhausted and potentially falls asleep on your table, which might actually be an excellent thing. Uh, mental disorders, mood disorders, and substance uh, abuse are the three major things I really wanted to cover, which is why I bumped this chapter up to week two. I really wanted you guys to be aware of potential problems or things that could occur during the massage therapy session that have to do with uncontrolled behaviors, surprising behaviors, and unsafe situations for you as a therapist. So your overall health is a state of your physical, mental, and social well-being. Um, in this chapter, we're mostly focused on mental health which is the state of well-being allowing you as an individual to recognize your own potential to do things, cope with normal ongoing stress of everyday life, and being able to work productively and fruitfully, meaning you get something back for your labor, and you can contribute to the community as a whole, which has to do with your social well-being. It's not only having friends and being social, it's what do you contribute to society as a whole. And this includes recognizing being able to appropriately express and modulate your emotions dealing with um, conflicting emotions. Like when you're angry, are you raging at your massage clients? No, you're able to tone down that emotion or compartmentalize a little bit to be able to functionally take care of your clients without inflicting emotional damage from your current ongoing everyday life stress. So some of the factors influencing mental health is brain chemistry. Um, fun fact though, just this year, 2022, there has been some amazing updates in information about antidepressant medication and anti-anxiety medication uh, being less effective overall in changing brain chemistry and therapy uh, being one of the absolute best factors in influencing positive mental health. Uh, so definitely check that out if that is something that you're interested in how brain chemistry affects mood disorders and mental health disorders. Um, another factor influencing those would be inherited factors like genetics and your family history. Um, there are developmental events and educational experiences, things that happened during your childhood or some trauma or large event that has happened during a very influential period of your life. Health practices, um, a healthy diet or lack thereof, exercise or lack thereof, and the types of relationships that you have with family, friends, and all types of members of the community. This can uh, be in the religious community, it can be in a professional community. Um, absolutely, those family relationships um, have a very, very strong potential to influence your mental health. So no, we know what factors can affect your mental health, but what is a mental disorder? What is some type of dysfunction of your mental health? And that could be any type of disturbance in cognition, um, your emotional regulation, or behaviors that reflect any type of dysfunction, um, either with your thinking, your body, or being able to develop in some type of way. 
And I love these statistics that the book gives. It says one in four American adults experience mental illness in a given year. And one in 25 American adults experience serious mental illness in a given year that substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities, whether that is functioning in your marriage appropriately, being able to do your job, being able to raise your children. One in 25 adults experience these mental health issues. And I personally believe that these numbers are low uh, because very often people are hesitant to seek help, feel that they cannot afford help, possibly genuinely cannot afford help, or do not know where to turn for these resources. And I would argue that these numbers are surprisingly higher in America at this time. I highly recommend that you go to your chapter 15 PowerPoint to look through several of the different disorders that we are not going to be discussing in this lecture. Because right now I really want to highlight the important ones that could affect you immediately within the massage therapy office setting. One of those disorders is an anxiety disorder. Um, this is where people can experience panic attacks. Uh, they may have phobias or um, very strong fears. They may have obsessive compulsive disorders or stress disorders or a post-traumatic stress disorder, um, PTSD, which is actually very common and something that massage is actually very effective with helping. So a panic attack in general is um, something that can be potentially dangerous in your office if someone is driven to feel like they need to escape the room. Uh, phobias may come up um, of particular objects or anything in general. You could have um, someone who has arachnophobia, you have a spider crawl across the floor in your office and they see it and they may lose their complete mind. You need to be ready for these things, although rare may actually occur and you need to be calm and understand what is happening when a client may go through something like this. If you have an obsessive compulsive client that comes in, they may turn the doorknob, you know, seven times to the left before they can lay on the bed. Maybe they can't turn over from the front to the back. They have to rotate their body three times before they can settle down. This is not something that necessarily needs to be commented on if it's not dangerous to you and if it's uh, something that they are obviously compelled to do just make sure that they're comfortable ask if there's anything that you can do to help improve the situation or make something more comfortable for them and move on now acute stress disorders you may have someone that acts a little bit disoriented um, they may disassociate a little bit uh, when speaking to them, uh, people with PTSD, you need to definitely ask them about things that could possibly trigger them, certain sounds in the music, touching certain areas of the body. You know, very often when we hear PTSD, we think of war veterans, but trauma, especially trauma that is experienced over the course of a year or longer in um, domestic violence situations or in an acute case of trauma like a type of sexual assault or physical assault and a robbery those type of things can scar someone and leave them with ptsd or cptsd for quite some time so you need to make sure that you understand that these things can appear very strange sometimes in how they act in terms of their behavior, in terms of thought process, things that they tell you that they need may seem strange. They're not necessarily scary things, just very different. And it is your role as a therapist to help them be as comfortable as possible as long as it is safe for you to do so. Your book defines a panic attack as a sudden, brief episode of intense, overwhelming fear and anxiety when there is no real danger or apparent cause. Just because something isn't apparent doesn't mean it didn't occur. Um, 
a panic attack can start, say if you have a creaky door on your massage office and the client hears it and it instantly triggers them to the time that they were abused in a room that had a creaky door. You have no idea that your creaky door is going to induce someone's panic attack and yet it does and there is a very specific cause that can be helped later for that particular client by oiling the hinges on your door. Now, the book also states it's a sudden brief episode. Very often, the panic attack itself may seem brief. It may only be a few moments, it may be a few minutes, but the after effects can actually last quite a while. There are hormonal changes, there's adrenaline, epinephrine, there's all types of fight or flight hormones that are coursing through that client's body at that point. And the come down from a panic attack can include crying, it can include shaking, it can include trembling as the body processes all these things that it's just gone through. And these things will be normal. Um, signs and symptoms of a panic attack is also a racing heartbeat, shortness of breath. They may feel incredibly nauseous um, during or after an attack. And these are things that you need to be aware of. Now, there are panic attacks, there are hypoglycemic events, and there are heart attacks. And you need to know which is which. Now, it's hilarious to me that the book is stating, you know, panic attacks, the intensity will decrease once the person is distracted. Yes, once their mind is no longer focusing on their fear and you have them calm down, the intensity of the attack itself will decrease. Hypoglycemia, someone's having um, a low blood sugar attack. If they eat a sugary source of food, that will resolve very quickly. Um, I would recommend still calling for help or making sure that some type of healthcare professional is aware if your client is having a low blood sugar attack. That can definitely lead to um, a diabetic event. It can be something very disastrous. I wouldn't just give them something sugary, definitely. The third thing is a heart attack. <laughs> and the signs and symptoms, according to your book, will increase after measures are taken to resolve hypoglycemia or a panic attack. If you feel your client is having a heart attack, please do not give them a Snickers. Please call 911 first. I can't say legally as a massage therapist that you should give them aspirin, but you should have it handy in case someone has a heart attack. And if they request aspirin, absolutely, absolutely, um, that should be administered as a good Samaritan. However, do not try to treat it as a panic attack or a hypoglycemic attack if you believe it is a heart attack. Please take life saving measures, call 911 immediately, and then try to see if it's one of the other two things that looks like a heart attack. All right, so two panic disorders that have actually been a big focus in the news since COVID-19 appearing in 2020 and all of the subsequent lockdowns that we were experiencing in America are agoraphobia and social anxiety disorder. Agoraphobia can actually start out small and grow. It can affect people working from home. It uh, has been affecting quite a few people in lockdown and also children who have been homeschooling for a long time with no social interaction with other students. In 2020 and 2021 were an excellent litmus test to see how agoraphobia grows in the general population. This is when an individual becomes fearful of being in, a, in an open or enclosed space is what it says here, but it's usually going out. Not only in crowds, but being away from home, being away from your safe place, 
or being in situations where escape might be difficult. Um, someone who is an agoraphobic might have issues going to a concert being in that sea of people with no clear view of an exit or being in the middle of an elevator with no real way to get to the door if it suddenly drops because people are blocking you is especially terrifying leaving your house to go into the big unknown sometimes becomes very very difficult these are people that you frequently see um, being called a hermit. They never leave. They stay in the house alone when the agoraphobia becomes very hard. In social anxiety disorders, people have a fear of situations involving interactions with other people in general. They're scared of embarrassing themselves, offending other people, or being judged or rejected. People with low self-esteem um, feel very bad about how they look. Um, which may be coupled with something like an eating disorder, they will often develop a social anxiety disorder. A lot of times this stems from things like being bullied at home during childhood or being bullied at school during childhood. But this can also develop as an adult. The more and more we distance ourselves from other people socially or have negative social interactions can build into a social anxiety disorder. Agoraphobia and social anxiety disorders are also very often coupled with other types of disorders like autism and ADHD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is defined as a later stage disorder characterized by distress and difficulty coping with the aftermath of trauma. So someone can experience a flashback back to that trauma. They may disassociate from current reality as they flash back to that trauma, or they may try to remove themselves from current reality if they are confronted with having to talk about the memory of what occurred during that trauma. It is often coupled with depression and very often people will self-medicate and abuse various substances in an attempt to treat how they feel and treat their behaviors. Um, there are a variety of things that could trigger a flashback with PTSD or complex PTSD. Those could be anything from a flickering light bulb in the office, something dropping and create a, creating a loud bang. Um, for those that were involved in some sort of violent traumatic event, if it is someone that experienced domestic violence or sexual assault, it could be a way that you hold your hand or not warning them that you are going to be placing your hand on a particular area of the body. This is why I highly recommend a technique of keeping continuous touch. Often we talk about using pump bottle dispensers for your lotion and oils so that you're not scooping into things or reaching things. It's not just for hygiene. You can keep your left hand on someone's body if you're right-handed and pump with your right hand to get oil or lotion in your hand and then rub them together while still maintaining contact with that left hand on the body so that you are not removing your hand, creating a jarring experience for any client on the table, but also not creating a scary one when you put your hand back down at some interval of time that your client cannot guess. Always communicating what you're going to do with your touch and what your intention is with your touch will help mitigate anything that could create a PTSD flashback or some type of panic event in the office. Just to reiterate with massage and any type of anxiety disorder or PTSD, Identify what those triggers might be. Ask your patient. You should see on the intake form if your client has one of these disorders. Um, ask them what will cause them to get overexcited or feel panicky. If they have an issue, if you are in a spa environment and there are multiple therapists, 
if it is a location that allows your client to choose a gender preference. Some do not, some do. Um, definitely ask that, especially if it's someone who is suffering PTSD from sexual assault. This might be a very important factor to consider. You could offer techniques that do not require them to undress. You can absolutely avoid any area that they request you not to touch, either due to pain or anxiety disorders. And you need to honor this every single time, even if prior consent was given. This is the most important thing for you to understand in everything in life. Prior consent does not mean current consent. And as we discussed in a previous chapter, it is not only consent, it is enthusiastic consent. If someone is very hesitant and they're like, uh, maybe it'll be okay. That means honestly that maybe it isn't okay. They need to be completely comfortable with the type of touch that you are going to be providing. You do not want to create a future problem for yourself, perhaps legally when they have decided that what was done in the massage therapy office was done without their consent. And you certainly don't want to trigger a panic or an anxiety event for them because they were unsure of giving you consent, did so because you convinced them that it would be okay, and then they ended up feeling terrible about it or having some type of flashback. And another thing that you can do is absolutely give them the option of having a friend or family member either in the room if there's enough room or, you know, keeping the door a little bit open. That might be a privacy concern if you're in a very busy place. In my private practice, I have a single office um, with two other rooms that are always empty right outside of it. So absolutely, there's no privacy issue with it being kept gapped open a little bit. If you are in a very busy uh, spa with like a, a hallway that people walk down in front of the rooms, you could definitely do something like to drape a curtain across a door that is left slightly open so they feel like they have that space, but there is still that privacy screen for that client. One thing to keep in mind, or rather nine things to keep in mind, are the nine principles of sensitive practice. And this is important not only for anxiety disorders or mood disorders, but just in your practice in general. Okay? You're going to show that client respect. You're going to take your time when you talk to them. You're going to be fully present. You're going to be actively listening to them. And you're not going to rush them through their intake or through their initial interview because you want to get them on the table so that they get their full 60 hands-on minutes. You need to be as slow as you need to be to get all of the information that's appropriate and that the client wants to give you. This means being less task oriented. You're not focused on, oh, oh, I gotta get my lotion ready. Okay, I gotta leave so that they can get undressed. Okay, now we're gonna we're gonna do the back. Oh, they have a bump on their leg. Okay, well, I have to move down to the foot now because I've already focused on the leg for 10 minutes. No, take your time where you need to take your time for that client. And that's gonna help develop rapport. That's developing and maintaining a demeanor that conveys genuine caring, and it balances not only professionalism with warmth and friendliness, but it balances your knowledge and your advice that you will give them as a therapist with what they are telling you as a client about their body, because they are much more knowledgeable about what they are currently going through than what you are. You may know how you want to help them with that issue, but they are going to educate you about their issue. You're going to share information, constant communication. You're going to tell your client what you are doing and why you are doing it. I would also add when you are doing it or how you are going to do it. I'm going to firmly press my hand to compress your thigh now. 
Tell them why you're compressing it to relax the muscle or stretch the muscle if it's a myofascial technique. Explain it to them. If they don't want you to talk during the massage, just gently keep your body for continuous touch communication if you are not using words. You're going to share the control. You're going to let that client be an active participant rather than just laying there and taking what you give them. You're going to ask them if the pressure is okay, if the lighting is okay, if the sound is okay, if they are comfortable. You are going to communicate with them so they can tell you freely, no, I hate this music. No, the pressure's too light. No, the pressure's too hard and it's hurting me here. I don't like the smell of the lotion. Can we please change it? Leave space for them to be able to tell you these things comfortably, especially if it's someone with a social anxiety disorder who doesn't want to create trouble or be judged because maybe they think the therapist loves that lotion even though it's giving them a headache and they're embarrassed or scared to tell you that they don't like it. Begin by saying, hey, if there's anything you don't like, you are in control of this session and tell me what it is that I can do to make it better for you during this session. And respect the boundaries that they give you. Having healthy boundaries helps to validate and reinforce what their worth is to them and their not only their bodily autonomy, but their health autonomy, all right? Something like sexual abuse we have here in the PowerPoint is a blatant disregard of those boundaries. Someone has touched them without their consent. They have crossed those physical boundaries. You as a massage therapist are never going to do that. You're going to ask them if that touch is okay. You're going to ask them if there are areas that you cannot touch. And you're only going to touch the areas that they have given you enthusiastic consent to touch and actively want you to treat. You're going to foster mutual learning. You're going to encourage them to question what you're doing and speak up again when they're uncomfortable. Hey, why are you pushing on my thigh that way? Well, I'm giving you compressive strokes because, and you're going to explain to them what they're doing, what you're doing. And if they don't like it, give them space to tell you that they don't like it so that you can change your technique and hopefully be just as effective to healing that area or relaxing that area while not making them feel uncomfortable. And you have to also understand non-linear healing. You have to check in with them every time you see that client and during each session with that client and make continuous adjustments according to what they state. If they have a pain grunt that doesn't sound very happy, if they're obviously turning their head to press their eyes as hard as they can into the face cradle because the lights are too bright, pay attention not only to verbal, but nonverbal cues that your client is giving you about their comfort level. And the last principle is demonstrating awareness of interpersonal violence, all right? You can have pamphlets available from local organizations. I would avoid putting ones out that are overtly religious unless you have a very religion-based office. Um, there are over 4,200 registered religions. I would hate that you would offend some clients by having one or two particular religious pamphlets out and not necessarily the one of your client's choice. Definitely put helpline numbers out. Um, things like 211 if it's available in your area where people can call for resources. Domestic abuse hotlines, suicide hotlines. There are a multitude of phone and physical resources in any given area and i would absolutely put as much of that information out in a place where your clients can feel safe getting it without being watched getting it if that means putting it in the closed massage room so that as they are getting ready to go on the table or dressing in privacy after the session they're welcome to take those pamphlets with them 
privately without feeling that you as a therapist or somebody in the lobby is potentially watching them get that information. Mood disorders are emotional disturbances consisting of prolonged periods of excessive sadness and emptiness, such as depression, or excessive happiness and elation, such as mania, or both. I would also argue that not only prolonged periods, but also the prolonged period of flickering back and forth between the two. Um, these extreme ends of emotions can significantly impair a person's capacity to function. Um, they may be upset and too depressed to feel like they can get out of bed or bathe or check the mail or answer phone calls. They may miss an appointment that they have with you because they don't have the capacity to call you to cancel because they just can't get out of bed that day. They may be so excited by something new and so wild and thrilled about this new hobby or discovery that they forget to come to the appointment. They're too busy dealing with whatever is giving them temporary joy at the moment. These excessive ends of emotion can be scary to witness. And not only do they impair their ability to do things correctly or productively, they can also cause people to do things that may be dangerous, uh, such as driving a car too fast, falling asleep driving, not paying attention, or crying too hard to see while driving. You need to be aware of the signs of emotional disturbances in your clients when someone is getting an unhealthy level of excitement that may cause them to react either violently or reaching out to grab you in a bear hug um, in a surprise or just start sobbing on your table, uh, which is something that happens more often than what you might think. Hopefully you are also not crying as you listen to the length of this lecture, but this is all very important safety information for you as a massage therapist. Some of those mood disorders to watch out for or the major types that you need to be aware of are things like major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, seasonal affective disorder or SAD, which frequently happens in regions where there is significantly lowered amounts of sunlight. Um, so not necessarily something that we would see in this state, except for maybe briefly during winter when people are staying inside for quite some time and we may have some cloudy snow skies for quite a while and shortened days. There are bipolar disorders where you will see some of that depression and mania flickering back and forth like a light switch, which can be disturbing to witness, perhaps a little bit scary. And there's also prenatal and postpartum depression, which is definitely something I would keep an eye on for the safety of the mother and the safety of the newborns. If you have someone that you have been seeing for quite some time and you notice a personality shift or a emotional shift in them, especially after giving birth and you do not know the cause of it, there's been no physical injury, there's been nothing that is um, an illness or a death to the child, please be aware of those things, um, especially with postpartum depression. There are steps that you can take to alert the client or perhaps alert another healthcare professional as that can lead into something that could be dangerous for both the mother and the children if it is not addressed. This leads us right into conducting a massage and having a crying client. Someone who's going through the birthing process has a ton of hormones going through their system and they could cry at any time. When you are working on someone on the table, they could have what's called 
a somatic experience or a somatic release where traumas are expelled from the body through safe touch and that may result in spontaneous crying. People who are depressed are more prone to just starting uncontrollable crying and they may not even know why they're crying. Having sleep disturbances, uh, especially sleep deprivation, um, will absolutely increase crying. People who are insomniacs uh, may generally cry throughout the day just because of their physical exhaustion and their inability to keep a grip on their emotions because they don't have enough rest to control those hormones and those emotions. And crying varies across, of course, genders, but mostly across cultures, how people are raised culturally to view what crying is. You know, the 1950s American man, you know, you don't cry, like you don't, you don't show that emotion. You're not weak like a woman, where women are often seen as hysterical and emotional and prone to crying. These are things to be aware of when reaching out. If it is a uh, male who sees himself in that role of needing to be very stoic, he may be very embarrassed if you are asking about his crying. I would suggest that you just try to make your clients as comfortable as possible. Offer them a tissue, offer them a damp towel to wipe their face without explicitly pointing out the fact that they are indeed sobbing on your table. You can ask them if they're all right, if they need a break, if you should step out of the room for a moment, if they would like you to continue. Ask them questions to make them feel as comfortable as possible without pointing out the fact, hey, I can see that you're upset and crying. Do you need me to? No. Phrase it in a way such as, could I offer you a damp towel? And here's a Kleenex. Would you like me to step out of the room for a moment? Would you like me to continue? This is completely normal and often happens during massage. People can have an emotional release and I'm completely comfortable with it if you are comfortable with it and move on from there. Here on the next slide for massage and crying, and this is out of your book. Um, it states when the client begins to cry, pause the massage, which you should do, and do not break physical contact, which is also true. You don't want to make them feel like you are rejecting them, that you are pulling away from them because you find what they're doing is offensive or in some way inappropriate. I don't know that I would necessarily tell them that crying is normal, but I would tell them that it is a common response during massage. It's definitely a release. And very often crying is a healthy healing release. Absolutely tell them that you are in a safe place. I don't know that I would personally say I am comfortable with your tears, but I would tell them that I am comfortable with them releasing any emotion that they feel that they need to get out or that their body is helping them to release at that time. Find your words. Find words that you know will comfort your client. Every situation is different. You know, it could be completely appropriate to rest a hand on the client's shoulder as a gesture of empathy, but some people may not want that, especially if it is someone with uh, autism or some type of anxiety disorder. Suddenly having that hand on the shoulder or being close to their face when they feel that they need some space while they're crying, it might make them feel claustrophobic. It might actually increase their anxiety. These are things that you need to be aware of. These are great suggestions, but they don't work for every client. And again, ask that client if they would like to continue with the massage, if they would like to take a break from the massage, if they would like you to step out of the room for a brief moment, or if they just need to stop completely before their scheduled time is over. 
no matter what that client tells you, be calm and accept what they tell you. Do not encourage or discourage any particular response. Let that client educate you on what they need in that moment and give them as many safe, genuine options as you are able to do so where you feel safe and comfortable with that client while they are in this emotional distress. The last thing that I really wanted to highlight for this chapter is substance use disorder, often also called substance abuse. Um, and that could be something like nicotine, which we don't usually think of. Um, people who are smokers of cigarettes, pipes, cigars. But this could also mean people who are wearing nicotine patches. You need to be aware of the effects of nicotine on the body. Um, if they are wearing a transdermal patch, where is that patch? You don't want to get oils around it um, to make it less adhesive. You don't want to massage over it. You need to avoid that area. This is something definitely to ask about. If you yourself are a smoker, especially things like cigarettes or cigars that leave a very strong odor on the hands, I highly recommend only smoking in gloves if you're going to do it during any portion of a day that you are massaging clients or before beginning your shift massaging clients i would recommend wearing a sweatshirt and perhaps even something over your hair that you can then remove when you are done smoking people who are non-smokers and sensitive to those scents can tell immediately if you are a smoker it's not only covering your breath it is absolutely keeping the scent out of the skin of your fingers out of your hands your hair and your clothing before you begin to massage someone if your client is an alcoholic you need to be aware of things like liver cirrhosis and what those implications are for massage you need to be aware of their drinking habits if they come into the massage office inebriated or under the influence. If they are a client that uses recreational or illegal drugs, are they coming into your office under the influence, which can create unpredictable behaviors, especially with some of the more illicit drugs such as PCP or crack or heroin, you need to be aware of behavioral changes, strength perceptions, mood disorders that can result from this, even a temporary emotional change. You need to be very aware and on alert for clients that may come in while using substances, especially if they are an addict. People that use prescription drugs. Um, this is something to be aware of. If someone is addicted to pain medications, or even if you wouldn't state that they are addicted to them, but rather they use them frequently, such as muscle relaxers or anti-inflammatories because of pain or nerve or muscle issues, these will affect how your massage is received. They may feel wonderful during the massage, but you could be doing way too much pressure or pushing in on areas of acute injury that you're not aware of because you cannot palpate that difference in the tissue um, and the client can't feel the difference in the pain levels because of their medication. And when that massage is over and the pain medication is wearing off, you could do more damage than healing work because you have re-aggravated re that inflammation, re-aggravated that injury, and caused them more pain in the long run, creating a bad environment for repeat sessions or for healing for that client. Very often disorders related to prescription drugs start with something that they 
need for physical comfort or for a mental disorder. And it has just snowballed and now they can no longer get off of it. Um, one example of this is children who are often prescribed Adderall for ADHD can very often become drug addicts when they are young adults and they decide that they no longer need the Adderall for, the, for their ADHD or their doctor suggests removing them from that and moving them on to a non-stimulant medication. They start to self-medicate to get the feeling of that type of speed again, that sort of stimulant for their brain and their body. Things that you don't intend to become substance abuse become that way through innocuous, often perceived safe prescription drugs. While I definitely would not recommend massaging someone that is obviously under the influence of heavy medication, illicit or illegal drugs, um, is inebriated with alcohol, there are recommendations for massage with substance use disorders. It can help clients cope with the disorder and it's actually recommended by the Addiction Help Center as part of the recovery process. If your client tells you of taking substances during the intake or during the massage itself, if they casually mention it, ask if they have to discuss this with their primary health care provider if they are abusing these substances. And definitely encourage them to talk to their doctor or talk to a therapist if they have one. Um, that is a healthcare practitioner or some type of psychiatrist, someone that has a relationship with the medical field so that they can get the help that they need to resolve these issues before it snowballs out of control. I know that this lecture has been very long for this chapter. Thank you for sticking through it. And I will see you for chapter six.